Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. Very excited for you to be joining us today. Uh, By the way, if you're watching us on YouTube, you know, you can always check us out uh, on uh, every podcast platform that's out there pretty much. I don't think there's a podcast platform out there that doesn't carry the lunch hour. Uh, If you are listening to us on one of those platforms and you want to see what's going on, check out our channel on YouTube at Federal Newswire on on YouTube. Please uh, leave us a review, uh, subscribe, uh, like us, do all of those things. And more importantly, spread information about the lunch hour via word of mouth or word of email or word of Twitter to your friends, your family members, your family members, friends, your friends, family members. Uh, Please let everybody know how much you're enjoying the lunch hour. Now, joining us today, uh, I'm very excited. I always am excited to talk to my guests, as you all all know, uh, but very excited to bring our guest on today. His name is Ryan Young. He's a senior economist at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And as I always say, when we've had on other CEI guests, I am a CEI alumnus. Uh, His research focuses on regulatory reform, trade policy, antitrust regulation, uh, and other issues. He is a prolific writer. He's a prolific speaker. Uh, He is a a formerly hosted CEI's podcast and writes their very popular This Week in Ridiculous Regulations series for CEI's blog. He's also on Twitter at at Reg of the Day on Twitter, which if you're not following that account, you should. Uh, He holds a master's in economics from George Mason, uh, a BA in history from Lawrence University in Wisconsin. He was previously CEI's Warren Brooks Fellow in 2009-2010, and he worked in the Government Affairs Department at uh, at the Cato Institute, something else he and I need to talk about, probably not online at some point. Ryan, welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. Andrew, thanks for having me. So, um, you know, we've spent a lot of time. I want to get into the, we'll get into the discussion later on about administrative courts, but because this is the beginning of the year, and when we're recording this, uh, I, I think this is going to be released towards the end of January, but we're recording this in the middle of January uh, of 2024. Let's talk about 2023. Um, one of the things that buoyed me is that, uh, that you know, you guys at CEI, you and Wayne uh, are, are friends at the National Association of Manufacturers. We all seem to be on the same page with the accelerated growth of the regulatory state under the Biden administration. What was 2023 like in terms of regulations? Well, it was bad. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> think that concludes our interview. There we go. All right. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. No, yeah, please. Nice talking to you. But, um, we actually saw fewer rules than usual uh, this year. For context, in an average year, agencies will issue well over 3,000 new regulations. That's 24-7, 365 uh, uh, days a year. We're talking a new rule every two and a half or three hours. Wow. And this year, or last year, 2023, um, we were down to just 3,018 rules, barely clearing that 3,000 barrier. Uh, Whereas the previous year, I think it was 3,168. The year before that, it was 3,200. We're also seeing a lot more rules uh, that aren't going through that formal process. They don't get counted. We call those regulatory dark matter. That's where agencies issue notices, press releases, blog posts announcing policy changes instead of actually putting it through the formal process. Are we noticing, are you guys, because I seem to be noticing, and and I know that the the plural of anecdotes is not data, but I have been noticing that even when we are going through a formal comment, notice and comment process, that the comment periods are being shortened. Um, You know, I'll give you an example. Um, The SEC just went through a rulemaking in the fall and they they jumpstarted it again in January after criticism, they they're they're a rulemaking under this whole ESG rubric of what you and me and Wayne have talked about the whole of government approach to create these things called natural asset companies. I don't want to go necessarily down that rabbit hole yet. You may not be familiar with it, but the point is the rulemaking or the comment period was only open for 21 days. Uh, I know that uh, um, this recent move by the National Park Service to remove the statue of William Penn from a, a national park site in in Philadelphia, that comment period was only going to be two weeks long. Um, are, are we seeing a lot of these a lot of these rulemakings being short? Have you noticed this at all, or or am I am I just sort of cherry picking here? I don't have the data, um, yes, but I probably. I think you're onto something. Usually, a comment period is sixty days, ninety days. 
Um, you don't see a lot of 21 days or that you're seeing. Yes. And, and, and they're also very reluctant to uh, extend common periods. I, they've, they've been a few instances where they've been caught, you know, with their hand in the cookie jar, this SEC rulemaking is a prime example where they they reopened it for three weeks, uh, starting you know. And you, I know you will appreciate this. They announced the reopening of the common period in the middle of the week between Christmas and New Year's. So it was just it was it was one of those things. Talk about this issue of regulatory dark matter, and actually talk about the issue of regulatory dark matter, but within the context of the transparency and accountability side of things. There was a. One of the good things that the previous administration did was there was an executive order to try to rein in regulatory dark matter by engaging in greater transparency and accountability. One of the first things that President Biden did was got rid of that executive order. Uh, talk about about those issues. And then that actually can lead us into the issue of, of the administrative courts. But but go ahead. Yeah, no, dark matter is a very important concept. And the pioneer on that was uh, my CEO colleague, Wayne Cruz, yeah. who's done extensive work on this. And like we mentioned, when an agency wants to issue a new rule, they have to go through a process. They have to publish a draft version in the Daily Federal Register. There's a comment period, which is getting shorter. Mm -hmm. um, but only then, after taking all that into account, can they then publish a final regulation. Um, and this process for agencies is a hassle. It can take six months. It can take a year. Um, there's a unified agenda where agencies publish all their upcoming rules. Some rules can stay on there for years running before they can finally run it through that whole process. Yeah. Um, if, a, if an agency is facing what it perceives to be a, an urgent problem, whether it's climate or equity or anything else, um, sometimes they'll just go ahead and issue a policy change through a press release or they'll publish a notice in the Federal Register rather than a proper proposed rule. Um, and we call that dark matter because we don't know how much of it there is. Yeah. We know that last year there were 3,018 uh, final rules that went through the proper process. We don't know how many dark matter rules are out there, but we also know that courts are upholding them um, when there's a controversy about them. It, it gives agencies almost unlimited power, very little accountability, and very little transparency. One of the examples that I use, and this is how I first learned about this 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, was a company, a chemical company that was being sued by the EPA. The EPA had issued a guidance document or regular, actually it was a regulatory interpretation letter um, that changed a policy prospectively, but they applied it retroactively. And the company was sued retroactively for the application of this policy. And it, it was one of these things, one of these environmental rules where they were going to be liable, it was thing was two thousand dollars per violation per day, and if you you know the way it was it was tolling, it was you know millions upon millions of dollars for this. This is what we're talking about here. This idea that you know it's already hard enough to figure out what your obligations are under the law under regulations. Um, now to sort of go through these obscure regulatory interpretation letters or guidance documents that you may not have ready access to to be held liable for it. This is a this is a a hugely problematic issue, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, agencies are only supposed to regulate from legislation that Congress gives them, and here we increasingly see agencies going rogue, and they're doing it with big rules. Yeah, uh, back during the Obama administration, they did uh, you know things on net neutrality, which yeah. Congress took up a bill and voted against it. Um, we've seen more recently uh, trying to redefine the Clean Water Act. Um, to so, give the EPA the power to regulate almost anything. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission is trying to issue rules on everything from junk fees to merger policy, oh, yeah. all without any congressional involvement. And a lot of it's coming through dark matter, not through the regular process. So let's 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 get back let's get back to the the, the numbers, 2023 by the numbers, because as you said, there were fewer rule makings, but we also know that regulatory costs have been going up by about. Well, I'm not going to say 35% a year because that's not an accurate portrayal of it. Regulatory costs have jumped up by 35% since um, uh, since Joe Biden took office. You know, we're now up at uh, uh, over $3 trillion a, a year in direct regulatory costs. That's not lost opportunity costs. Do we have any idea? Actually, I'm sorry, Ryan. Let's focus on how they're changing the definition of major rules and so that they can get away with rules costing more while they regulate less. Talk about that. Yeah, that that's an important transparency issue right there. Um, a lot of times agencies will, uh, you 
know, small rules, no one cares if it's just paperwork, so what? Uh, but for bigger rules that might have hundreds of millions of dollars of economic impact, the requirements are a little bit stricter. Um, from the Clinton administration, actually from the Reagan administration right. up until now, um, any regulation costing more than $100 million per year got a special tag. It was called economically significant. Um, then the Office of Management and Budget would take a look at it, do their own cost-benefit analysis, and get special disclosure, more transparency. Uh, the Biden administration didn't care for that, so they did a couple of things. One of the things they did was they doubled the threshold from $100 million to $200 million, so more rules slip under that threshold and escape review. The other thing they did is they stopped calling it economically significant yes. and they gave it the much less memorable section 3F1 designation. Um, so if you're doing a text search through a rule, you have to remember that and where to put the parentheses and F1 oh, yeah. and all that. Um, and it's 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 a major transparency dodge. It, it's a way uh, for agencies to do pretty much whatever they want with much less accountability and much less transparency to the public and to people affected by the rules. It's interesting because, and this is something I talked about with Wayne over the summer, because they changed a lot of the regulatory analysis rules. Not that we need to bore everybody with discussion of Circular A4 again, but the, the point is, that came out of my discussion with Wayne, they've doubled the, the threshold for this. And I, we'll get to the Congress side of it in a second. But they don't really care about costs anymore. For them, it's all about benefits, isn't it? Yeah. In fact, you know, I said, you know, for the big rules, the three F1 rules, um, the rules get special treatment, extra review. Um, in the past, the Office of Management and Budget would have to look at it at least relatively impartially here, what we estimate the costs and the benefits to be. Um, under the revision, the A4 circular, um, as well as the uh, change from economic significant to 3F1, um, instead of trying to provide objective information, OMB's job is now to justify the regulations. They've gone from analysts to cheerleaders. That is not a healthy change. If right. your goal is, even if you favor the types of regulations being put out, um, that you don't have good information on whether it's going to do what you intend it to do. Uh, this is just a bad governance strategy, regardless of your po politics or your views on regulation. You know, it's it's a situation, and, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking about comparative risk assessment, which is a, a, a vital tool. And the, one of the things I always talk about when I talk about comparative risk assessment is this issue of, you know, cost-benefit analysis only tells us if doing a, a engaging in a rulemaking, engaging in regulation makes economic sense, right? It it doesn't it doesn't tell us if it's smart from a policy perspective more generally because of the unintended consequences or the other risks that are created and et cetera, et cetera. But now it's completely valueless because it's not telling us if something it gets to this idea. There's something that I've been positing for a bit. Um, in this other issue, this natural asset. Are you familiar with this natural asset company's situation? Have you heard about this at all? Not as familiar as I should be. No, I got, I got, I've got to send you this stuff because essentially, it's it's the 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 SEC and then I guess later on the Department of the Interior will be creating value in rights to clean air and clean water. Um, uh, you know, in in public lands, public resources, so that those can then be sold to massive hedge funds and be used as carbon credits and carbon offsets. It's a, it's a very convoluted thing that sounds crazy. I, I got to send this to you. But unfortunately, the comment period is we're recording this closes tomorrow. But set all of that aside, that's a, a failure on my part, Ryan. My point is, if you are making up the numbers, right, there's, I'm reminded of, do you ever see the movie, uh, the, the Gangs of New York? Yeah. Okay. You Rem remember that Boss Tweed says to one of his underlings, it doesn't matter how many votes we have, it's, it's who counts the ballots that, that 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 counts, right? The idea is if you're just making things up from whole cloth, you can do anything with it. If you're making up these artificial values, whether or not it's artificial values of benefits or artificial values for how much value we place in in a in an airshed or a watershed uh, for its environmental protection benefit, you can do anything to justify it, right? It, it just throws it all out the window, and and the entire public policy world collapses on, on itself, doesn't it? Yeah, and it, it's been a problem all along, but it's yeah. a lot worse now. I mean, the EPA for years has been playing all kinds of shenanigans with uh, concepts like life years saved or how much uh, benefits might accrue to, gosh, there was one rule, 
pregnant fisherwomen in the Great Lakes region who consumed more than however many kilograms of fish per year would benefit by this much. Oh my God. And that justified a rule that would cost about $10 billion per year. This, this reminds me of the time uh, my, my boss I was working for was testifying on a Clean Water Act case. And the uh, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers brought in a muskrat, an expert in the in the interstate muskrat trade, to sort of justify the the interstate regulation of of uh, of uh, non navigable waters in the United States. Um, let's get back to this because I mentioned Congress. So the here's the interesting thing, right? The administration can go and they can change the economic significant definition, but Congress still defines economically significant rules as as hundred million dollars a year or more. What's what's Congress doing about this, if anything? Well, here's where it gets complicated. Thank you, lawyers. Um, there are different thresholds for significance. There are different types of significance. There's a whole other category called major. And when you're talking about the Congressional Review Act, you use one definition. Um, what Office of Management and Budget's working with is another definition. Right. Um, so there's really no single standard, which just creates even more confusion and even less transparency. This is like uh, this is like when we when we define small businesses, and there are like 600 different ways to define small businesses according to the federal government. And you know, for me, it's businesses with 20 employees or less, and that and that's because of the impact of regulations, and now that and that changes things. Um, so clearly, you know, a, a new Congress. And if you know if the administration changes hands, this is something that needs to needs to be dealt with. Um, let's, but but the problem, of course, is right. I mean, circular A four, which I, I am going to go down this rabbit hole. This is the 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 guidebook by which the agencies are supposed to review, uh, you know, regulatory costs and benefits. That was updated last year for the first time in twenty years. If a new administration were to come in, it would take a Herculean effort to change it, wouldn't it? Or 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 could they just revert to the old, the old, the old, the old circular? Well, inertia is pretty strong. In fact, uh, one of my pet theories is that it's one of the strongest forces in politics. <laughs> so any effort to either update it or revert it, you know, change in either direction is is very very difficult. It's it's a once every decade or two project. So I I don't see that happening. So the die is really cast. It's just going to take a much much more careful and steady hand at the regulatory wheel. A strong uh, uh, administrator of the Office of Informational Regulatory Affairs. Uh, in the next administration to come in in order to do this. You know something, I, I think you and I have talked about this. So if regulations now, I spend a lot of time talking about the regulatory glide path. You know, we spend, a, we can talk about, about a, and then I think you the last time you and I spoke, I talked about this, right? It's the idea of, obviously we would love to bring the regulatory costs down, but there's a certain benefit to keeping regulatory costs on an even path, right? If the path that we're on right now, regulations will be at about $7 trillion a year come 2030, right? That's just projecting, you know, 35% over the course of X number of years. But there's a certain, but if we were to keep regulatory costs constant at $3 trillion a year, there's a benefit in terms of not adding that extra $4 trillion in cost, isn't there? There's enormous benefit, even yeah. whether you're talking about compound interest or what, Um Boy, that reminds me of a study by uh, two guys named Dawson and Cedar. Where they Dawson and Cedar. I love yep. this. You're Actually, familiar with this. Hold on for a second, Ryan. You may be the first person I've met who's read that study other than me. But go ahead. Talk about <laughs> Dawson and Cedar because I love this study. Well, hopefully our conversation today can change that. Yes. Um, those of you listening or watching, please Google Dawson and Cedar on regular costs. S-E-A-T-E-R. Um, yeah, the, their main finding was that if regulation or regulatory compliance costs had held steady since I think the mid 1950s, um, just through the power of compound interest, the money saved year after year after year across the decades. Um, by the time they published that study around 2010 or so, um, the economy in 2010 or so would have been, I believe, triple yes. the size of right. what it actually had been. Um, that's the power of compound interest. So yes, savings matter, even decimal points, as much as I make fun of them sometimes, even decimal points in that kind of areas matter. Right. I, it's funny because I, I I turn that around and, and sort of, you know, doing some of my own noodling through and calculations. It, what it means is that there, for every dollar in direct regulatory cost, there's something on the order of a $19 multiplier in indirect, you know, lost opportunity cost that's there. And so you're right that a, so a regulation that costs a hundred and by the way never do Ryan I'm just going to tell you this 
you should never do math on the air. And I should know <laughs> this by now, but that for, you know, essentially for every million dollars in regulatory costs, there's a million, there's $19 million in lost opportunity cost. So a, a hundred million dollar regulation is, is, you know, anyway, whatever a hundred million times 19 is, um, um, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's massive. And yet we we don't talk about this. It's funny because I got into it with somebody who claimed years ago that there was no cost to regulation. In fact, talk about opportunity cost and talk about this idea. The, the left has this idea that regulations spur economic activity, right? This idea that if, and, and the example I use is uh, uh, if I'm a, a glazier, if I'm someone who repairs windows for a living and my my, my business is, is not, stagnant i'll send a kid to run through a strip mall and throw bricks through all the windows and now i've created economic activity that's essentially what the left is saying talk about this talk about talk about capital redirection and why this is a problem and and talk about it in the context of the dawson and cedar study yeah and just you know we talked already about the futility of trying to estimate regulatory benefits yeah um you've also just brought up why it's ultimately futile to talk about regulatory costs it's because of opportunity costs that can't be quantified um, you can't really hold a press conference about the success of your deregulatory program if you stand in front of a factory that was never built, surrounded by workers who were never hired, right. who don't build a product that was never invented. Um, those are the kinds of opportunity costs. They exist. They're real. And yet they cannot be quantified because even though they're real, they're invisible and we cannot see them. That is vitally, vitally important. And what the Dawson and Cedar study tells us is that over time, all the new regulations that keep blocking and blocking this project and that project and uh, block new ideas from being acted upon or prevent companies from raising capital to put their ideas into action, the costs are enormous. Even though we don't know, uh, this is where I make fun of decimal points again, right. even though we'll never know exactly how much they are, we do know that they're huge and they right. matter. So, so let's then talk about this in the context of the work that you do on regular week and the ridiculous regulations, uh, or regular day at it's at regular day on Twitter. Is that, I may have screwed that up before, but the, yeah, the, yeah, the, right. the, this week in regulations, because I used to when I when I used to talk about this and still do, you know, that it's death by a thousand pinpricks. It's the little things. Um, that that add up. Talk about some of those little things. Talk about talk about you know some some of what's happened in the last couple of weeks in terms of regulation. Yeah, um, for over a decade now, um, every week I've done a regulatory roundup on the CEI website, CEI.org, and um, every morning I uh, when I get up in the morning I look at the day's Federal Register, which probably tells you more than you need to know about the type of life that I live. Um, but I tally up how many new regulations are issued, how many final regulations, how many proposed regulations, how many notices, how many pages. And then I also take notes on any new regulations that come out um, with links to the full text. And all this is on CEI's website, CEI.org. Um, I have the most recent edition up and from some, some of the final regulations, just to give you an idea of what's going on. Um, there is a National Potato Promotion Board and they are changing some of their uh, board membership requirements. Um, a bunch of agencies are inflation adjusting their civil monetary penalties, pretty harmless administrative stuff. Um, new regulations on importing archaeological artifacts from China. Um, Gulf, there's an emergency haddock action in the Gulf yeah. of Maine. Um, just all these kinds of things. All of these are little regulations taken by themselves. They're pretty harmless, but when you have death by three thousand cuts per year, right? What's up? But that 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 you know, it's funny. When I was teaching this, and I think I may have mentioned this before, when I was teaching on the regulatory process, um, I would the, the, one of the very first things I would have my students do is to go and visit regulations.gov. For those of you who are unfamiliar, I think we've mentioned this. Regulations.gov is a portal where you can comment on most, not all, but most of the regulatory proposals that are out there. And they have a really great resource, which is regulations that have come open for comment in the previous week, or proposals that have come open for comment in the previous week, and proposals that are being closed for comment in the coming week. And I would have them pick one from category A, one from category B, and summarize it to offer a position if they wanted to offer a position on it. And the idea was we would put them all up on the big board. And the idea was to give the students uh, an understanding of the breadth of the regulatory state, everything, you know, from 
schedules of uh, drawbridge openings on the intercoastal waterways, which isn't a rulemaking, but still they're open system for comment um, to uh, the, uh, you know, the endangered, you know, fairy shrimp uh, regulations in, uh, in uh, um, uh, the central Valley of California. I mean, all, you know, big, big to big to small, um, you know, because most folks just don't they, like, like they, they, and this is, I guess, gets into the work that our friends at Mercatus do to an extent, right. To sort of talk about it in terms of, the households, you guys do a really good job at CEI of explaining this in terms of people's daily lives. In fact, talk about that a little bit, Ryan, if you would, the idea of of how this, how people can see these things in their daily lives, whether it's dishwashers or toilets or cars or what have you. Yeah, well, dishwashers are hot right now. Yeah. Um, my colleague, Ben Lieberman, um, is, ben. is on, been on that issue for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, the regulations that get a little bit stricter every few years about how much water and how much energy um, a dishwasher can use. And over time, the cumulative result has been dishwashers that don't wash dishes very well. Um, what used to take an hour and change now takes over two hours. And even then, the dishes don't necessarily get clean. Um, you're seeing similar things happening with washers and dryers. You probably notice that your washing machines are a lot more prone to mildew and dampness because oh, yeah. of energy regulations. Um, these things add up and they affect people's everyday lives and they just make it a little bit worse at the margin. Even as technology itself gets better and better and better, um, you have this countervailing force that just makes things a little less convenient, a little less helpful, especially for people who don't have time or a lot of resources uh, to adapt to these things. Uh, I'll tell you something. I, I, I had to bring a car into the shop and I got a loaner. And, and then this is more on the, now on the legislative side, the, the, obviously the regulations are going to come out later on. Um, and it was one of those things where it's a new car with one of those big screens, you know, the, to, to sort of deal with the radio and the air conditioning thing. It's not knobs. I like knobs. It's a screen. So as I'm looking down, trying to get the thing to turn off the, uh, the automatic uh, uh, steering wheel heater. Yes, this is very much a first world problem, right? But I'm looking over to try to find the button, to turn off the steering wheel heater. And I get a little, ding on the on the dashboard that says hey you're not paying attention to the road i mean this is this is this is what this is what we're getting to here and now they're talking about uh, a technology that's going to turn off cars you know when you do that it, it, it's these things have impacts don't they yeah and you know slippery slope arguments yes. sometimes they're true you got to be careful with those but yeah sometimes they're true they're proposals to have kill switches in cars for all kinds of reasons um but yeah, it's, uh, you know, just you go throughout your day, um, everything is regulated. The total regulatory code, um, if you want, you can uh, order the whole shebang from the government sure. printing office. They will send you in the mail 243 volumes wow. that total more than 188,000 pages. And our friends in Mercatus actually used, uh, you know, searchable uh, uh, text technology to go through it. And they found that those 188,000 pages contain about 1.1 million individual regulatory restrictions. Wow. That That's affects, astounding. I mean, it that really, affects, and, and, and yeah. listen, not that this is either your or my bailiwick, but the implications, actually, I'm sorry, it is absolutely, it's a perfect segue into the administrative courts issue. Because, you know, I was going to talk about Henry Silverglades, you know, three felonies a day issue, yeah. right? So Classic. one point. 1.8 million different separate small regulations and mandates that are out there. Nobody can possibly know all of them that's in there. It gets us into the territory of Lavrenti Beria, the, the head of the Russian secret police. Show me the man and I'll show you the crime. It gets even worse when we talk about these administrative courts. Talk about the issue. And, and, and this is a conversation by folks that Ryan and I have had on the radio and we've had on the, the, the Swamp Secrets podcast that I do. But I want you to talk about it here Jessica Malugin and I have talked about it as well, but this is this is a massive issue, and it it. I'm sorry. Let me let, I, before we get into it, Ryan. I think I may have asked you this before. How did you get interested in these issues? It started when I was a teenager, just with the basic anti-authority instinct. There Who are go. these politicians? Who are these regulators telling people what to do? I don't think that's right. It's grown since then. I'm. I look young, but I'm in my 40s now. Um, but it's that same basic impulse, even as it's grown up over that, the years. That's that's the, where I was. That's what I was getting. That's why I asked you this question because I came at it. I came at it the same way. 
this idea of basic principles of fairness. Uh, someone who was doing work with my family uh, had fallen into one of these administrative traps and, and it bothered me on sort of a fundamental level. It's why, by the way, folks, I, I may, I've had folks on from the Institute for Justice before. That's why, you know, to me, in terms of, and CEI does great nonprofit legal work. In fact, doing even better, greater nonprofit legal work these days. Um, not everybody's doing, I'm sorry, but I want to get into a comparison between CEI and IJ. They're all doing great work. My point is, is that CEI's legal work has grown. But my point is that's, you know, it, it comes from the same impulse, this what the hell is going on in this world? This is not American. So now talk about this thing that offends me at my core, which is the issue of administrative courts and administrative law judges. Um, not that we need to talk about deference. I think my folks have heard me talk about deference ad infinitum, but we can delve on that. But talk about the problem. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't know this. So I'm always grateful for a chance to talk about this. Please. But we have two court systems in this country. Um, the Constitution outlines the separate branch, the judicial system that we have, you know, along with the executive and the legislative. Three branches of government, separate powers, based on the whole principle, don't put too much power in one place. Right. Um, that goes back to our founding. It's a separation of powers issue. There are more than 30 federal agencies that have their own in-house courts. And these include big agencies like the Federal Trade Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and inside these agencies' in-house courts, um, the agencies hire their own judges and they pay their own salaries, so they're not independent. The agencies set the rules of procedure. The agency sets the rules of evidence, um, and many agencies stack the deck so that the prosecution can view some forms of evidence while they withhold that from the defendants who are not allowed to look at that and not allowed to defend themselves. So in, a regu in the regular court system, Defendants have a, or the government wins about 60% of the time. It's more than 50 50 because usually they don't, the government doesn't bring a case unless they think they can win it. So right. 60 40, the government wins. In the SEC's in house administrative law court, their win rate is more than 90%. In the Federal Trade Commission's in house court, they just last year snapped a 25 year winning streak. Crazy. And when they lost that case, the S FTC commissioners overruled their own judge and handed themselves the win anyway. Wow. The case is still being litigated now. It was moved over to the regular court system. It is blatantly unfair, um, and it results in many cases being litigated twice. So unless you have a lot of resources, right? Um, if you're not a wealthy defendant, a lot of times you do not get justice. Right. And it's amazing to me because you guys are the first folks who are really talking about this. You guys being CEI. CEI.org is the website. Um, the only ones really talking about this, I am, I am shocked that no one has brought this up really. Maybe I shouldn't be, right? It was 2016, the first time I ever heard a presidential candidate utter the phrase regulatory budgeting during a debate stage or, or during a, 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 a primary debate. But you know, it seems to me this is a massive problem. I mean, um, how many, I mean, do we, have we quantified how many cases are going on? Do we have any particularly egregious examples of, of what's going on? You and I have never talked about this. So I may be putting you on the spot here, Ryan, and I apologize for that. But I mean, any, yeah. any particularly egregious examples or any hearings on this? What's going on? Yeah, actually, my colleague Stone Washington and I uh, actually recently published a paper about administrative law courts, making the case for moving them out of agencies and into the regular court system right. so defendants actually get a fair shot. Um, the administrative law courts do do some legitimate things. They have some legitimate expertise. There's a reason they exist. But for separation of power reasons and for fairness reasons, they don't belong inside the agencies. Don't put too much power in one place. Put right. them in the proper judicial branch where they belong. So essentially um, because, right, you know, it's one of these things where we have a special tax court, right? That, that's uh, yeah. We have a special federal court of, of federal claims we could have a special federal administrative court system that's, that exists outside of it. Not, not that we want to go and create more bureaucracy, but it really isn't. It's, it's, it, but we do, right. It's one of these things where we always get into these things, right. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the other side saying, well, you know, in order to, in order to be deregulatory, you have to go through the regulatory process. Yes, but we're doing the right thing in the end. This may create greater, you know, uh, other kinds of bureaucracy, but it, protects individual rights. I'm sorry, talk about this. Am I am I on the right track there? I may have looked yeah, at that. You are. And and one of the things I like about the way the founders set up the judicial branch 
it doesn't have a fifth size. Yes. That makes sense because they have a country with a growing population. You know, when the country was founded, what was the population? Six or seven million. Right. It's over 330 million now. Of course, and of course, you have growing regulations, more laws. Of course, you can have more and more litigation. So they set up the judicial system with no fixed number of judges, no fixed number of circuits or appeals courts. So that can grow along with the population and along with the legal and regulatory codes. Right. So what I'm saying here is don't abolish those administrative courts because they do have some legitimate purposes. Put them in the independent judicial branch so the government doesn't stack the deck in its favor and win 90% of the time. There's a reason why rights have to be protected, right? It, it, it comes yeah. back to one of my, it's it's two quotes really, but but the, the main one is, you know, a 1992 Supreme Court case, New York versus United States. Uh, you might've heard me say this before, Ryan. Um, Justice O'Connor writing for the court said, the constitution protects us from our own best intentions. It divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely so that we might resist the temptation to concentrate power in one branch as the expedient solution to the crisis of the day. And then they goes on to say that federalism secures to individuals the liberties that derive from the diffusion of sovereign power. And, and you know, for me, that's sort of how I've always approached public policy, right? We, we, we want to diffuse power so that we protect individual rights, right? The, the, the goal of our government, the, uh, the prime directive of our government is the protection of individual liberties. I think you would agree with that. Oh, very much so. That's, that's why we have government in the first place, and that's yeah. why we have separation of powers. You want power as close to the individual as you can, as close to the state and local level as you can get it. When you do need a federal level, um, well, then you divide it between the different branches with their different responsibilities. You need checks and balances. And that's where these administrative law courts go very, very far wrong. It's not only contrary to the founder's vision for the country, it's contrary to anyone's notion of fairness or justice. Well, I want to work with you on this uh, on this uh, issue to uh, to re reform these administrative courts. I want to say this now uh, on the air. So it's like a, I'm I'm sitting here and I'm 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 figuring out tasks for CEI. Right, you guys did this really great movie a couple of years ago called I Pencil, and then I believe you followed it up with I Whiskey. Um, you know, it seems to me you've got a there's a great movie to be made on just what you were saying about this idea of someone standing in front of an empty field and sort of talking about the the factory that could have been built and the jobs that would have been created there's something there's something in there on this regulatory glide path thing and i'm also thinking about some kind of you know some kind of story some kind of video on this i mean maybe you guys have done this and i and i'm missing it have you guys done a video on this administrative courts issue and the unfairness something based upon your paper or are you thinking about it not yet but my ears are open andrew there you go i i, I think i think there's there's something there's something to be said for that Definitely. Let's let's turn our attention a little bit to um, to you know some of the other big big numbers issues. You just did a piece on uh, on inflation. Um, uh, talk about this more than more than meets the eye on what's going on with inflation. Talk to us about that. Yeah, um, we had some new numbers come out. I think last week, um, but really that's not the important uh, thing. What's happening this week or this yeah. month? The story with inflation is the story of COVID. Yeah. It goes back to that. And so if you want to understand what's going on with inflation, you have to understand that bigger picture. It's not just this news cycle. Um, that's actually true of a lot of issues. Yeah, sure. but, uh, but what happened when COVID is uh, two things. One is that the Federal Reserve freaked out. Um, they saw a crisis and they panicked. And they panicked by creating $5 trillion worth of new currency. Wow. Um, to some extent, that was justified when people are spending less and dollars are circulating more slowly. You want to counterbalance that by creating a little more money to even it out. Sure. Um, but instead of doing what they should have a little bit, they went way overboard. Right. Five trillion dollars, 40 percent monetary growth in two years. That's quadruple the normal rate. Holy biggest God. in American history. And then you have Congress uh, and Presidents Trump and Biden um, combining to spend another five trillion dollars, which we're going to be the national debt uh, has exploded because of that. Right. Um, those two things combined resulted in the biggest inflation in 40 years. We're now in the come down phase from that. Um, for a little less than two years now, the Fed um, got its senses back. They are drawing back that $5 trillion increase. 
They've also raised interest rates to slow down all that excessive currency circulation a little bit. And of course, that's coming at great cost to people like you and me through higher mortgage payments, higher car payments. That's all an inflation tax. And there's really nothing to be done about that because of the mistakes that the Fed and that Congress and the president's made. Um, so we're in the come down phase from that. There's still a hangover from that. Um, what we're worried about right now is if there's another sign of trouble, if economic growth slows, if unemployment starts growing up, is the Fed going to panic again? Is Congress and President Biden, our, our Congress and President Biden even go back into stimulus mode and create more inflation again? That's the trap that we got caught in in the 1960s and 1970s. Yeah. And what markets and investors are worried about now is this going to happen again? So, so that's what we're keeping an eye on. I don't think I've ever asked anybody this question. Uh, and, and, you know, and not, not Wayne, certainly is late. I don't remember asking this question and, and understanding that, you know, that the fed is in charge of monetary policy and not regulatory policy, but does the fed understand what's happening with regulatory costs in America? Have they ever said anything about the cost of regulation and how that impacts economic growth? I, I know it's an odd, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. That's a good question, because um, you know too much money creates inflation. But if regulation saps productivity, that again gets things out of balance. And right. good monetary policy is a matching game. So if regulations cause real productivity, but the money supply stays the same, you get more inflation. Right. Um, and now that's a weaker effect than the monetary printing press. And I mean that can go up to infinity in theory. Sure. And Regulation affects growth by maybe one or two percentage points. Yeah. Um, but the effect is still there and it's still real. And the Fed, in my opinion, does not pay nearly enough attention to it. Right. I mean, that's the thing. It's it's one of those situations where the, the economy was booming along. The previous administration, they kept, you know, regulatory growth relatively constant over time. Right. I was skeptical. Listen, I think I may have said this. I was skeptical of the concept of the, uh, you know, two out, one in or one in, whatever it was, you know, getting rid of two regulations for everyone that that was being implemented. I, and I still don't know if that happened. All I know is that from a cost perspective, essentially, you know, regulatory costs were the same when, you know, Obama left office is to roughly the same. I know not exactly the same, but when, and then when Joe Biden took office, things had stayed relatively constant over time, which we never really seen before. Um, and so had, had Biden not hit the regulatory gas pedal when we started to end the lockdowns, I think we would have been in much better shape. I, I suspect we would have been in much better shape, certainly on, well, at least on the, uh, par, par, partially on the debt side. Uh, you, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, going back to that larger story of COVID, that's the context we're yeah. working in here. You had a mostly healthy economy when the pandemic hit. There was inflation was fine. There's no savings and loan crisis, no housing crisis, no financial bubbles. Shuts down because of COVID. And then as things got safer, open back up. Right. So if, if government had done nothing, if the Fed had just done a little bit of monetary nudging instead of the five trillion dollars, would have been like nothing happened. Right. And then when you make it more expensive to build houses for a whole host of reasons, you know, whether it's whether it's making appliances more expensive or building materials more expensive or zoning, not that the federal government's in yeah. charge of zoning, but you make all of these things more expensive and you make loaning money more expensive and all of these things have an have an impact here it it's it, it it all it all conspires you've done some work recently on the jobs numbers talk a little bit about about what's going on with with jobs again how much of this is covid related and stuff you know are, are people are we creating jobs or are people just still going back to work what's going on there well um we're basically at full employment right now um and that's one thing i worry about is people misinterpreting that especially people at the federal reserve yeah for the reasons we talked about, if things start to slow down a little bit, are they going to freak out again? Um, they have to avoid that. Uh, so what we've seen, been seeing the last few months is that job growth has been slowing, slowing, slowing um, to the point where it's under 200,000 new jobs on net per month. Um, that annualizes to a little over 2 million, uh, 2.4 million per year, which is roughly what population growth is. Yeah. So really that's all staying the same. That's fine. That's about where you want it to be if you're already at full employment. So when people are saying that it's job growth is slowing, at some point it has to. Yeah. But on the other side, uh, there's the labor force participation rate. Yeah. And that's where COVID comes back in. Yeah. Talk about um, it. Yeah. Um, that went down sharply during COVID in part due to uh, stimulus payments, people deciding right. to live on savings, as well as legitimate safety concerns. Um, so you had just for context, right now, it's at about 62.8% of working age adults uh, 
participating in the labor force. During the worst of the pandemic, that dipped down to about 61%. So, you know, decimal points, but 1.8% um, of a 165 million person workforce, yeah. you're talking between two and a half and three million jobs. Wow. That's a lot of right. uh, people who just straight up left the workforce. We've had unemployment below 4% for about two years now. Um, but that doesn't really matter because it doesn't count those 3 million people who cool. just straight up left the workforce. Now they're coming back. The labor force participation rate at 62.8 is pretty much right where it was okay. from, say, 2014 to 2018. Historically, though, that's very low. It's lower than it was in the 90s or the 80s or even the 70s. Um, that's been a long-term decline, and that's something that I'm a little bit worried about. And I think there's a deregulatory stimulus that makes it just easier for people to find jobs, not have to ask government permission, get licenses, that sort of thing. That could go a long way getting that back up to where it should be. So we're fine from COVID at this point, finally, but there's still a lot more we can do. You doing, uh, you, you, I know it's important, obviously focusing on the federal regulations. You doing anything on those sort of those state licensing things? I know our, our colleague uh, Shoshana over at R Street, she does a lot of that. Uh, are you guys, are you doing any of that too? Or is this, is this, you have your hands full with the federal stuff? We're happy to lend a hand, but Shoshana's doing great work. Yeah. Um, Pacific Legal Foundation, Institute for Justice, they're all doing fantastic work um, in the courtroom as well as in the court of public opinion. Everybody's um, got to be uh, strategic, unique, and measurable. So, you know, you, you don't want to, we don't want to uh, work across, not across purposes, but duplicate efforts, right? That's the, that's a, yeah. Nice so measure. happy to lend some support, but you also don't want too many cooks in the kitchen. So before I let you go, um, something that I bring up with most of my guests, uh, when I was originally conceiving of a, of a podcast, I was going to do one called outside interest. I think I may have mentioned this before, which is, uh, uh, the idea of asking people in the policy world, cause we're not one dimensional. Some of us are, uh, but we all have things that we do that are not related to policy. When you're not doing this work, what are you, what, what, what are you up to? What, uh, what kind of things uh, do you do to entertain yourself? Oh, well, I've been uh, playing guitar since I was about 10 years old, played in yeah, bands right. when I was younger, still have an interest in audio production and just my economist brain, you know, look at different frequencies where uh, you want your kick drum and your bass down low, but you don't want it interfering with the mid range instruments. So sure. just, you know, a little bit of Adam Smith, division of labor mixed with some rock music there. It. Uh, it all ties together. So what, I, love uh, I mean, like cause that. that's exactly it. I mean, this is part of the reason why I want to do this. I found out that a, a Senate staffer that I got to know was a, a major guitar player and, you know, another, another guy interested in, in, in audio issues. Who are some of your, some of your influences, some of your favorite uh, guitarists, some of your favorite musicians? I mean, what, uh, what, uh, what floats your boat? Oh, lots of stuff. Grew yeah. up on a lot of 80s stuff, The Cure, Depeche Mode. Nice. Also a lot of indie rock from the 1990s, you know, Sunny Day Real Estate, Promise Ring, stuff like that. Some of them were, you know, I'm from the Midwest, so I love those Midwestern bands. I, it's, it, you know something? Actually, it's so funny. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of a band that was out of Chicago in the early 90s called Maybe Definitely. A uh, guy named Grant Tennyson uh, was the lead singer. He then got into advertising, and I was obsessed with their their first album. I, I was at a conference in Chicago. I saw them playing at a bar near Northwestern and bought their bought their uh their their cassette and the cassette was sort of lost to the ages um i i may i i may send you some of their stuff because i think i think you might you might again that midwestern yeah, sound i have been going back through early 80s new wave stuff nice um, you know which is which is which has been good actually you and i've never talked because i'm a huge music buff folks as we're recording this for instance today uh, i'll take 10 seconds on this today is the uh the 50th anniversary of the release of Joni Mitchell's Court and Spark album, which is one of my favorite albums of all time. Not a guitar album, but she was in many ways a guitar player. So, oh, she's um, one of the best master of open tunings. She's great. Yes. Yeah. It, in fact, there's a really great picture. If you've never seen this, um, I've I've long been obsessed with the Laurel Canyon music scene of of LA in the late 60s into the early 70s, and and Mickey Dolenz was taking pictures at. It just sounds like a bizarre sort of anecdote. You know, something that uh, uh, Dr. Z would tell on the Hanging with Dr. Z podcast. Um, party at Mama Cass's house. Um, Mickey Dolan's walking around taking pictures. Eric Clapton has been invited to the party and he's just staring at the way Joni Mitchell is playing and has tuned her guitar. It's really, it's an it's an amazing, amazing picture. Um, Ryan, listen, I appreciate that. Tell us Tell us how we find out more about the good work you're doing again. Sure. Uh, I'm with the Competitive Enterprise Institute, or CEI. Um, our website is cei.org. 
And I'm on Twitter at, at reg of the day, reg being short for regulation, believe it or not. But yeah, CEI.org, reg of the day. Go and go and check it out. Listen, Ryan Young, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks, Andrew. It's been a delight. This has been yet another episode of The Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I am, of course, your host, Andrew Langer. Again, check us out on YouTube or every major podcast platform. Please subscribe, leave us a review, let your friends know about uh, what we're doing here. Thank you all so very much. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream 